It is sometimes said that the abortion debate is about values rather than facts. An honest debate about abortion, however, is about values based on facts. If we don't get the facts right, we will not get the values right. Establishing by clear scientific evidence the moment at which human life begins is not the end of the abortion debate. On the contrary, that is the point from which the debate begins. That is a quote from Richard John Niehaus, editor-in-chief of First Things, and that is what I'm talking about today. Stay tuned. Hi, folks. Welcome back to the Pro-Life Guys podcast, a show dedicated to equipping you with the tools that you need to have compassionate and compelling conversations about abortion so that together we can change minds, save lives, and transform our culture. My name is Cam. I am the host of the show. Welcome back to the Pro-Life Guys podcast. This is cool. Um, happy to have you along for the ride, whether you are a first-time listener or a long-time listener. Um, thrilled to be back in the studio again. As I mentioned, it's been a bit of a, a long, dry summer with regards to recording. I know that we even missed last week on a recording as well, but we should hopefully be back as more regular episodes, but I appreciate everyone who tunes in. Um, the feedback that we've gotten on the last episode on um, how to transition back to your home communities after an internship. Um, heard from some good people about that. And so today we're diving back into more conventional apologetics. Um, shout out Mitch, one of our volunteers here um, in the Calgary area, who's talking to my colleague Quiana about doing a bit of a deeper dive into biology. And I want to start with a bit of a an anecdote. So you can see this lovely little degree behind me from the University of Victoria. That is uh, my bachelor's degree in biology with a focus in genetics and developmental biology. That happened a long time ago. I have forgotten most of what I learned in that degree. Um, however, when people hear that I have a degree in biology, they figure, oh, this is great. You can change people's minds because you have a degree in biology. To which I very frequently reply that um, you don't need to have a degree in biology. Generally speaking, what you need to have is some degree of mastery of middle school to high school biology to be able to have the vast majority of conversations about abortion um, and to be able to clarify when does human life begin. And in today's episode, we are going to put on not necessarily the full-blown laboratory goggles, but maybe we're putting on a lab coat and we're going to talk a little bit deeper about biology. And that quote that I shared off the top, this scientific understanding should form the um, the basis, the, the underpinnings, the foundation of the conversation about abortion in the words of my great friend and former colleague and inspiration in the pro-life movement, Stephanie Gray Connors. She always said that if abortion does not kill an innocent human being, then no justification for abortion is necessary. However, if abortion does kill an innocent human being, then no justification for abortion is adequate. I'm sure that she borrowed that from somebody else because that's something that I'm sure has been said um, since long before Stephanie got involved in the pro-life debate and conversation. Um, but as my colleague Jonathan Van Maren says, um, there's no such thing as plagiarism in the pro-life movement. Um, I don't know if that's quite true, but I'm going to run with it because Jonathan says it often and Jonathan's a good friend of mine. And so I'm just going to run with it. You can blame it on him. If I am plagiarizing people, I will not plagiarize people the entire time today. I'm going to rely on two papers. I got them here in front of me with a whole bunch of um, notes and whatnot from Dr. Mar Maureen Condick, who I believe is a very, very eloquent and um, accessible um, academic in the realm of neuroscience and developmental biology. She has taken upon herself in many ways to contribute tremendous clarity towards the conversation about when does human life begin? And we're going to be relying on a lot of her content today because we have questions about when does human life begin and the science of the pro-life worldview. Is this a belief that is steeped in religious doctrine and theory or is it something that is steeped in science or is it both? Um, I would argue that the humanity component of our roadmap, for those of you who might be new to the the concept of having strategic conversations about abortion, I want to suggest this roadmap of basically always starting your conversations about abortion by addressing common justifications, whether they are presented explicitly by the person that um, 
you are talking to right then and there, or even if they want to bypass them, still giving them a shout out. I agree that there are problems in our world, or I think we can both agree there are significant challenges and problems in our world that mothers and fathers are faced with um, that demand solutions. Imagine that parents of born children were faced with similar crises. I don't know if that's quite the right word, but would we ever suggest we kill a born child to solve those problems? If not a born child, why a pre-born child? We want to start the conversation through the lens of both compassion for mothers and fathers experiencing challenging pregnancies, but also with clarity towards what are the differences between born and pre-born children and are preborn children living members of the human family? We want to direct the conversation towards the humanity of the preborn and the principles that underpin the entire conversation around abortion um, and the humanity of preborn children are composition and behavior. And I'm actually going to address them as behavior and composition because I think that that's. Um, how the biological community, especially Dr. Marine Kondik and those that have really taken an intentional deep dive into this issue, have addressed them. Before I dive into that, I want to offer a suggestion for something that I know is done frequently in the pro-life movement that we ought to avoid a little bit more. And what I mean by that is leaning into the idea that we don't know when human life begins. I've heard it taught um, both at CCBR and in numerous other pro-life organizations that if somebody says we don't know when human life begins, that we can lean into that and say, you know what, let's grant that conclusion. We don't know when human life begins. If we don't know when human life begins, don't we need to play it safe? Um, maybe we're, we're going to use common ground analogy question in the way of I agree with you that it can be difficult to know exactly when does human life begin. Imagine that we didn't know if a born human was a born human. If we don't know, can we kill them? Um, at times, I, I think of Scott Klusendorf's um, case for life, um, especially his condensed version that was like a 40-page booklet that was so handy. And and the question from the child while the, the parent is washing the dishes, mommy or daddy, can I kill this? Well, what is it um, is the question, that kind of thing. Um, and if we don't know what something is, if we don't know if the rustle in the bushes is a human or a deer, you can't shoot unless you're absolutely certain that it's not a human. All of that kind of ambiguity around leaning into a lack of knowledge as to whether or not they're human. And a logical way, I think that there's a logical foundation for that, that if we could lean into, we don't know when human life begins, therefore we all have to play it safe because this could be a living human. That might work logically, but there's a pressing desire for abortion. And we have a generation or multiple generations now that don't feel the um, intellectual or academic rigor of needing to follow through on that conclusion that you're right, I don't know if this is a human, therefore I am morally obligated, logically obligated to not kill them until I know with absolute certainty that they're not human. There are people that are not willing to wait at that stoplight. And so we have to give give concrete evidence to demonstrate that no, we do actually know when human life begins. Without a shadow of a doubt, um, as Dr. Stephen Jacobs from the University of Chicago has demonstrated through his polling, the overwhelming majority, over 90% of people polled within the academic and professional biological embryological community have acknowledged that human life begins at fertilization. How do we demonstrate it? Well, like I said, we are going to apply the principles of behavior and composition. What is something doing? Is it acting as an organism in and of itself? Or is it acting as a part of an organism or simply as a clump of cells kind of thing? And so once we know if we have a whole organism, then we'll be able to ascertain, well, if it is a whole organism, then what kind of whole organism is it? If it's not a whole organism, then we don't need to go through the second route of what kind of organism it is it because it's not an organism. Therefore, we're safe, we're fine, don't worry about it. And so I think the first question goes into behavior. Second question goes into, um, into composition. 
And so how do we do that? I'm going to rely, I'm going to drop links in the show notes below for those of you tuning in on YouTube. Thank you for all who do tune into YouTube. We're up to over 730 subscribers on the Pro-Life Guys YouTube channel there. I would love to get to a thousand by the end of the year. And so if you're listening on a podcatcher and want to see the paper that I'm holding up right now, go onto our YouTube channel. This is When Does Human Life Begin by Dr. Maureen Kondik. Um, it is the white paper. What is a white paper? A white paper is the definitive paper on a particular topic. This is the white paper on when does human life begin. It is very, very well described. The second resource that I'm going to be leaning on for those on the YouTube channel, um, defining organisms by organization. And so the question that we're going to go through, the number of questions, the process we're going to go through is going to be varying levels of um, depth around addressing the behavior and composition of a human being and demonstrating that that behavior is that of a unique organism from the moment of fertilization and that the composition of that unique organism is human. We're going to go into further deep dives after this episode, but I don't want to get too consolidated into this because I want it to be accessible to as many people as possible. And so what I want to start with actually is the human rights argument. The human rights argument is the beginning of all of our conversations about the humanity of preborn children. We address the justifications, we go through our common ground analogy and question, but it's different. Um, preborn children are not human. They're just a zygote. They're just an embryo. They're just a clump of cells. They are not human like born humans. We're not going to go down to personhood. We're not going to try to justify why all humans are valuable or why embryos and zygotes are valuable. We're going to demonstrate why they are human first. And we're going to launch through those four questions of the human rights argument. Question one, do you believe that all humans should get human rights? This is a philosophical question, but underpins the importance of this issue. Question two is our first biological question, which directly connects with that underlying principle of behavior. When we ask the question, if something is growing, isn't it alive? That is a question about the behavior of an entity. It implicitly um, challenges the, the person we're talking to, as well as ourself, to understand if something, if, if a coordinated something, if something that can be defined as an entity in and of itself is growing isn't alive. I'm getting a phone call from Kyle right now because we're getting our time zones mixed up. Kyle, I'll talk to you later. Um, however, um, if something is growing, isn't alive, this is taking a look and testing the intuition of the person we're talking to surrounding the behavior of that organism. If something is growing, isn't alive. That is not a perfect question but it is an effective question. It's not a perfect question, obviously, because there are living entities that are not growing, right? Single cell organisms, bacteria, yeast, stuff like that, um, stuff that you probably would rather not think about is not strictly speaking growing, right? It's not becoming a multicellular organism. It is dividing into more single cell organisms, not getting bigger. And so there are living entities that are not growing. On the flip side, strictly speaking, there are growing entities that are not living organisms. And we're going to dive into that a little bit later. But this is our first line of defense that we're going to draw on the intuition of people to understand that something, something that is coordinated, something that can be identified as an individual entity is growing. Growing is a very good indicator of life. And the second or the third question of our human rights argument hits on the composition component of if we have a living something, if that living organism has human parents, again, we're implying that by human parents, we are um, transferring a human genetic code. We are maintaining um, the composition, the stuff of the human species. If we have human parents, isn't he or she a living human, living human organism? And finally, question four, if that living human, um, doesn't that make abortion a human rights violation? So again, do we agree all humans should get human rights? Question two, if something is growing, 
isn't it alive? Looking towards the behavior component of this scientific question. Question three, if that living organism has human parents, isn't he or she a living human? Looking at the composition component of when does human life begin? And finally, putting a, a bow on both the philosophy and the biology, wouldn't that make a abortion a human rights violation? And so this is the foundation of our scientific approach. And for many people, this is sufficient to change hearts and minds on the abortion issue. What if it's not? What if people look at this, um, these four questions and they say, that's too good to be true. You guys are trying to paint me into a corner, but I'm not buying it. They're not human. Well, one thing that we'll often do is we'll offer a clarification. This isn't a requirement. I would argue that the human rights argument should be a requirement. It is the first and best thing that you should be doing to challenge um, the humanity of preborn children and the presence of a human organism from the moment of fertilization. The second thing um, and many of the rest of these things you could look at as what resonates, what makes sense, rolls off your tongue. The first um, or the second thing that I would, first thing I would suggest, the second thing for you to, to do would be a clarification. And what I mean by that is that sometimes we'll trace our life back to the moment of fertilization. I think this is a clarification in so much as it makes concrete these questions, which can be a little bit abstract. And so if we're looking at tracing our life back and we say, okay, look at my, my little timeline. Um, this is a folded paper. My, my timeline, if I am here in my lived experience, um, before I was a human adult, I was a human teenager. I didn't pop into existence as a human adult. If we trace time backwards, I was a younger, maybe smaller, less developed version of myself. Before that, I was an adolescent. Before that, I was a toddler. Before that, I was an infant, but I didn't pop into existence either in my behavior or in my composition. So this is just kind of a general clarifier as an infant, the stork didn't randomly have a baby just appear and drop it off on your parents' doorstep. No, we can trace our life back through a consistent and unified behavior and the presence of our human composition back to the fetal stage of human development, back to the embryonic stage of human development. We didn't pop into existence as a six-week or eight-week embryo. However, we did literally pop into existence as a one cell human zygote. Um, and we can trace our life back. And that's where we're going to start peeling back the curtains on a more explicit and more direct conversation around the composition and behavior of the organism. Because as we trace our life back, the, the natural question that comes up is, can we trace our life back to being a sperm cell or an egg cell? And what we have to ask is, what is the behavior of a sperm cell or an egg cell? The behavior of a sperm cell or an egg cell is to contribute to the whole of something larger, being the man or the woman. And that is their function. They don't function as a coordinated individual that is prolonging, developing their own life. They are at a, a state of somewhat equilibrium that unless they achieve their goal of fertilization, they will die. That is serving the function of a greater entity, the promulgation of the species. The behavior radically changes at the moment of fertilization. When there is fusion of the cellular membranes, the radical shift in behavior occurs. Everything that that new zygote does is directed towards the welfare of a new entity. It is no longer trying to serve in any way or contribute in any way biologically to either the man or the woman, but rather behaving in a way that serves a new entity, serves a defined entity in no longer a greater scaled up capacity. So behaviorally, there's a radical and fundamental change that happens at fertilization. And also compositionally, we go from haploid cells containing the genetic information of another individual um, to having the genetic information of a new individual, 
a new genetic code, not a genetic code that is half the moms, half the dads, but rather a genetic code that is entirely a new organism. And those are the factors that we are going to reflect upon at this point. As we trace our life back, we can trace our life back looking at what we're doing and what we're made up of to the moment of fertilization, but no further. And so I would say that after the human rights argument, that tracing our life back, relying on the intuition that something big changes at the moment of fertilization, that I am me as an adult, as a teenager, as an adolescent, as a toddler, infant, fetus, embryo, zygote, but no further, because something big changes at fertilization. At that point, the third thing that I would consider, if that resonates, if that helps them appreciate, okay, biologically, I have been me from that moment, great. One thing that I very frequently do is I appeal to authority, appeal to authority and direct them towards the understanding. I, I ask people to Google, when does human life begin? Because if you're not willing to believe me based on the simple common sense and logic of the human rights argument or the clarification of tracing my life back, then maybe you'll uh, accept out of hand the overwhelming biological evidence from the scientific community that you'll find on your phone, on your desktop, wherever you're searching for the information. If you're old fashioned and you're going to go to a library and pull out a textbook, I am going to appeal to authority. I do this all the time at universities, at high schools, downtown, on doorsteps. Um, somebody pushes back and says, hey, this sounds good, but I, I don't believe you. This is not when human life begins. Hey, do you have a phone? Can you Google when does human life begin? And every credible source, including many pro-abortion sources, are going to acknowledge that human life begins at fertilization because of these considerations of behavior, behaving as a unique, organized entity, and composition. What are they made up of? They're made up of the stuff of humans, and it's acting as an individual organism. Therefore, it's an individual human organism. Human life begins at fertilization. Okay. And so that's what the biology is going to say. And there are going to be some people who say, you know, this is out of my league. I am not an expert in biology. Even if I am an expert in biology, I am willing to accept the authority of people who do this in a professional capacity. Right. And so an appeal to authority might be something of a logical fallacy. However, socially and conversationally, it is incredibly effective because many people are willing to accept the authority of a formal figure like what you're going to find on any search engine search, whether you're um, cooler than a Google person. If, I mean, I don't think Bing is cooler than a, a Google person. If you're a DuckDuckGo or if you're a niche um, independent search engine person, whatever your search engine of choice is, that's where you'd go. Okay, what if, what if there are questions that go deeper than that? What if there are questions about um, specifically the behavior of an organism? They say, okay, well, I agree that it's behaving differently, but it, it's not their own behavior. It's not that this is something, but rather that they're being built into something. It's not a computer until it has a central processing unit in it. It's not a car until it has an engine in it. You're not a human until you have a brain in it. Those kind of objections imply a form of construction rather than development. And as Maureen Condit goes into in both of these two articles that I'll drop in the show notes, as I mentioned, um, as Maureen Kondak and many other biologists who seek to clarify this question will get into, there's a radical difference between construction and development, first and foremost, in the acting force. The acting force in construction is external, right? A car is constructed by an external force. The external force is both providing the material and the direction. Whereas growth, whether human growth, any other mammalian growth, any kind of biological growth, is the materials may be present, uh, provided by an external source. The food, the oxygen, the hab um, habitable environment may be provided by an external force. However, the direction is provided by an internal force right? We don't grow our garden by building leaves and tacking them onto the outside of our plants. We don't build a human 
by tacking arms and legs and cells onto the outside of something, providing both the direction and materials from an outside force. No, the mother provides the materials, the preborn child provides the direction, the internal direction versus external direction. And so if there's questions that try to conflate growth and development with construction, pointing towards the acting and directing force will help clarify that, that there is um, a fundamental and radical difference between um, internal direction and external um, construction. As we're hopefully that makes sense. Let me know if you have questions about that. And so, so far, we've covered the human rights argument, which is our tip of the iceberg of the behavior and composition, these two defining attributes that we look towards when it comes to what something is. Is it an organism? And if it is an organism, then what kind of organism is it? We start with the human rights argument. At times, we may clarify by tracing our life back from the moment that we are now as adults, maybe you're a teenager, maybe you are an adolescent, however old you are, looking at your life and tracing it back to the moment of fertilization with, again, an eye towards both the behavior and the composition. Um, beyond the clarification, we are going to appeal to authority, trusting that and acknowledging that the biological community refers in depth and at times over our heads um, to these two factors of behavior and composition. And they have come conclusively to the principle that human life begins at fertilization biologically and to so appeal to authority. And then when questions about comp um, construction come up of trying to liken biological um, growth to inanimate construction, implying that you don't have um, an entity, you don't have a human until they have reached a particular threshold of construction, changing that around to understanding the difference between construction and development based not on where are the resources coming from, but rather where is the direction coming from. Finally, the last thing that I'm going to dive into is that clarification about behavior and composition. And I'm not going to dive into this super, super in depth. As I mentioned, there's going to be subsequent episodes that dive further into this, particularly diving into this, episode, um, this um, understanding of defining organisms by organization, the second paper that I have from Dr. Maureen Kondik, that really does an excellent and wonderful job asking questions about how do we differentiate between, for example, human organisms that don't survive to adulthood because of disabilities or other genetic abnormalities between those and entities that don't become adults because of the fact that they are not actually organisms in and of themselves. And what I want to do is I want to read a quote from this Defining Organisms by Organization from Dr. Marine Kondik. It's on page 337. I'll drop the link in the show notes. It says, and I quote, the essential difference between human cells, i.e. cellular organisms extracted from or identical in type with the cells found in humans and human organisms. So difference between human cells and human organisms is not their relative independence. This isn't their ability to survive without anyone's help. Rather, one needs to look at the highest level at which integrated organi organismal function occurs, i.e., is there evidence for a level of organization above that cellular level? And I think that that is incredibly illuminating when we ask the question of, is this human tissue, are these human cells simply, or is this a human organism? Are they functioning in an integrated, coordinated capacity for the, the well-being and function of a whole, or are they the whole in and of themselves? And so if I look at that, if I have, if I, if I remove, again, for those YouTube listeners, if I, if I pull off skin cells and culture them in a 
in a petri dish, a, a plate, a scientific plate for those who might be unfamiliar with what a petri dish is. It's just a plate that allows for experimentation because of um, what it's made of. Um, you can help those skin cells stay alive, whether they are on my body and at that point contributing to the whole of my body. They're a part of my body because there's a higher level, there's a higher order of coordination above their cellular function. The cells are working to keep themselves alive, but there's a order of coordination above that. They are, while they're attached to my body, contributing towards the whole of an integrated organism. If you remove them, they're no longer contributing towards the whole of my body. This could be likened towards sperm cells or egg cells even. But that does not mean that they have become an individual organism themselves because there isn't a coordinated and integrated direction and um, identity there. Okay? That hopefully makes sense at a, at a higher level that there's the question of is there a higher degree of organization and complexity, integrated behavior and coordination happening? If there is, then you don't have an organism. If there is not um, a higher level, then you may have an organism depending at times on the composition of that entity. And so the composition, what is it made up of? Is it made up of the stuff necessary for inherent organismal activity and development. I think to use an example, you look at a tumor. A tumor has the composition of human cells. It has human genetic code. It has human um, cellular organelle in them, mitochondria, the, the powerhouse of the cell, as many of you will remember. Um, don't say that to a science teacher. They will um, not smack you, but be disappointed in you if that's all you remember about the mitochondria. Um, it has the composition, but it doesn't have the behavior. It is doing a lot of stuff. A tumor, as crazy as it might sound, a tumor might grow an eyeball or hair, or toenails, or different cellular parts, but it's doing it in a chaotic and random fashion. There is no organized, directed, um, integrated function of a whole. It is random, chaotic activity, and because of that, though the composition might fit the bill of human it's not a human organism because it fails on the behavioral component. On the flip side, obviously, when we look at um, when we look at non-human organisms, we can say, okay, that tree in your front yard, that kitten on your lap, whatever it may be, that entity is functioning as an integrated, coordinated entity. And so we have an organism, an organized organism here. But compositionally, it is not human because it has a genetic code that is other than the human species. You can't, you can't, I can't, most people can't look at a genetic code and be like, oh, I can tell that's human or not human. That's why we have that third question of the human rights argument, namely, if that living organism, if we've identified that there is a living organism, has human parents, isn't he or she a living human? That is a very, uh, is a completely logical and com completely sound way of determining are they, if there's a living organism and that living organism has human parents, then that must be, therefore, a human organism in and of themselves. And so asking that question, particularly about the behavior, I feel like there's very few people that are going to challenge the compositional question. There's very few people that are going to try to split hairs on that. However, being able to ask that question of the essential distinction, as I mentioned, between human cells that are not a human organism and a human organism is the question not of independence, but rather of highest level of integrated organized behavior. Is there a higher um, command center, a higher organization center, integrated function that this cell or group of cells, organ, organ system is contributing towards in a um, total fashion? 
right? And so this isn't independent. This isn't, okay, well, I contribute towards my family, therefore my family is one human. No, this is in a biologically coordinated fashion that happens without consciousness. This, this is not the, the liver is deciding to contribute to the whole of the body in the same way that my, myself, my wife, my children decide to contribute towards our family or the society or our culture or government or whatever. No, this is not a conscious contribution, but rather a biologically and natural um, contribution in a coordinated fashion. I hope that that makes sense. Again, to walk through those steps, you are starting with the human rights argument, um, especially those two central questions, this human questions, number two being the behavior. If something, if a, a coordinated, integrated um, entity is growing, isn't it alive? And question three of that human rights argument, if that living organism has human parents compositionally, um, isn't he or she a living human? sometimes clarifying by tracing our life back from adulthood or wherever we may find ourselves to the moment of fertilization again with an implicit consideration for the behavior and composition of that organism, appealing to the authorities, um, acknowledging that there are people who have answered this question definitively definitively and there's a universal agreement that by all by all biological standards human life begins at fertilization again because of the considerations of behaving as an independent organism and compositionally being a member of the human species um, if we have questions particularly about the development component and the questions of behavior around development and construction not where are the resources, where's the material coming from, but rather where's the direction coming from? Is it an intrinsic direction being an organism directed um, development or extrinsic being an in inanimate construction? And finally, if we need to get down to definitions, being able to clarify the behavior of an organism is fundamentally different than the behavior of parts, so parts versus holes, a whole organism is the greatest level of coordinated and integrated behavior. If it is contributing towards something greater than itself, then it is a part, not a whole. But if it is the highest order, highest magnitude, um, highest degree of coordination and integration, that at that level, you have an organism and compositionally, is the composition, not just the genetic information, but also the rest of the biological stuff in the cell, in the organ, in the organ system, is that fundamentally human? That's what we're going to walk through. We'll do future episodes on how to further explain the differences between, for example, a human being with profound disabilities that prevent them to reaching um, adulthood and a clump of cells and cellular activity that fails to reach adulthood because it is not an organism, because it is not organized, coordinated, and integrated in a manner of a defined organism. Tumors don't become adults because of the lack of organization and integration. Um, human beings with profound genetic disabilities do not become adults in spite of the fact that they have a coordinated, integrated, and um, systematic um, behavior because of a failure inside. To use a crude example, um, the reason why your car might not start is because there's a problem with the car. The reason why the heap of random mechanical stuff in your garage might not start is because there is no coordination. That goes beyond biological information. That's why we're going to do a deeper dive at another episode. I hope that, that makes sense. Give me a shout if you have any questions, any comments, any concerns with that explanation. Thanks again to Mitch for suggesting the topic through my friend um, and colleague, Koana. I hope this helps clarify things. Check out the links in the show notes below and may God bless you abundantly wherever you're at, however many hours are left in your day.